Good evening, everyone. My name is Andrew Fracknoy. I'm the astronomy instructor here at Foothill College, and it's a pleasure for me to welcome all of you here in the auditorium and watching and listening on the web to the ninth annual Silicon Valley Astronomy Lectures here at Foothill College. These lectures are sponsored by NASA's Ames Research Center, the Foothill College Astronomy Program, the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, and the SETI Institute. And we're very grateful for the support of all these organizations to make these dynamic introductory talks in astronomy possible. Tonight's talk is by Dr. Jeff Marcy of the University of California, Berkeley. Dr. Marcy is the world's leading planet hunter, having with his team found more planets than anyone else in the world and in history. He is professor of astronomy and director of the Center for Integrative Planetary Science at the University of California at Berkeley. And he was one of the youngest scientists to be elected to the National Academy of Sciences, our most distinguished national body of scientists. Among his many honors, he has won the Shaw Prize and was the California Scientist of the Year in 2003. Uh, what's especially exciting for me about Dr. Marcy, besides his work, is his very strong interest in education and public outreach. He teaches introductory courses at Berkeley. He gives many public lectures around the world and devotes a lot of time to sharing his work with the public at large, including his website, exoplanets.org. To explain his work, he's appeared on many national and local television programs, including the David Letterman Show. Uh, if he can survive that, he can survive any NASA or NSF board. Um, he was also the first speaker we ever had when we got these lectures started, and after nine years, it was high time to welcome him back. For me, this is like being able to introduce Columbus, or Magellan, or Captain Cook, someone who has spied new worlds that none of the rest of us have seen and can tell us in person what it was like. So ladies and gentlemen, it is for me both a professional privilege and a personal pleasure to be able to introduce to you discussing new worlds in Yellowstone, how common are habitable planets, Dr. Jeff Marcy. universe, as you all know, is expanding and indeed accelerating, uh, and it contains exquisite beauty uh, that brings many of us here tonight. And of course, the universe also contains extraordinary and baffling mysteries. The universe we now know consists of dark energy, dark matter, and a smattering of luminous oases uh, we all call galaxies. In fact, we live in the Milky Way galaxy, as all of you know, and our Milky Way galaxy is itself an enormous place with spectacular mysteries. The Milky Way galaxy contains 200 billion stars or so, and it's 100,000 light years across, which means that traveling at the speed of light, uh, a laser pointer or a flashlight the beam would take 100,000 years to traverse the length of our Milky Way galaxy. So it's an extraordinary place, this galaxy of ours, but what I find most compelling and I think intriguing about our Milky Way galaxy is that the laws of physics, of chemistry, of mathematics that we all learn as school children apply equally well everywhere within our Milky Way galaxy the laws of gravity, electricity and magnetism, quantum mechanics even, and the constants of nature are the same from one end of our Milky Way clear across to the other side and indeed within our entire universe of hundreds of billions of galaxies like our Milky Way, the laws of physics and chemistry and math also equally well apply. And that tells us something 
profound, I think, and indeed beautiful, which is that the physical properties of our world, the Earth, our solar system, its sun, the sun and the contingent of planets, probably has properties that are duplicated elsewhere within our Milky Way and the universe at large. That is, the physics and chemistry of our Earth are no different than the physics and the chemistry that apply everywhere else. And so we might imagine that, therefore, planets like the Earth, solar systems like ours, might exist elsewhere within our Milky Way galaxy and beyond. What we don't know, however, is whether there are comparable laws, indeed universal laws, of biology. You might ask yourself, is there one equation of biology that you learned in high school that you can write down that assuredly applies throughout our Milky Way galaxy and beyond? And I would suggest to you that we do not have any such knowledge, even conceptually, of rules, laws, uh, principles of biology that we're sure can apply elsewhere. So we are remarkably ignorant in the field of astrobiology. And in particular, there are some questions of biology that you might ask whether or not they indeed pertain throughout the universe. One is whether or not liquid water is a prerequisite for life as it seems to be here on the planet Earth. You might also ask whether or not the organic molecule that codes for the structure of one generation after the next and to the next, DNA, is the only organic molecule that can perform this function, or whether in fact there might be other molecules that can serve to code life from one generation to the next. Finally, the question of biology that intrigues me the most, and perhaps you also, is whether or not intelligence is really the pinnacle of Darwinian evolution, or whether or not we humans instead represent some twig on the evolutionary tree, some fluke, some lucky throw of the dice that occurred on the East African savanna two million years ago, allowing the early hominids to uh, uh, become bipedal, develop big brains and dexterity so that someday they could write uh, symphonies and build rocket ships. We don't know whether intelligence is a normal outcome of evolution in general and certainly throughout the galaxy and the universe. So our ignorance of biology is a little embarrassing, maybe profound, and of course it stems from the fact that we still, to this day, here in 2008, have only one example of life within our universe, and it's the example right here on Earth, where all the life is based on DNA. And so therefore, we can't generalize any laws of biology without more examples to draw from. And of course, we are looking for other examples of life elsewhere in our universe, notably just within our solar system, the sun and the eight major planets. Uh, we have already sent spacecraft to all of them, indeed one is about to arrive even at the, the recently demoted Pluto, uh, and it will search, I'm sure, uh, for some hints of any life there. I'm not very optimistic. The remarkable bottom line that all of us know is that despite the great exploration of our solar system that has occurred since the 1960s, we still to this day have no evidence of even microbial life, never mind advanced life, anywhere within our solar system. Most excitingly, I think, we will continue to send probes to Mars, especially just near the edge of the polar caps, where some liquid water might exist, perhaps subterranean, uh, giving life a chance still there on the planet Mars and in a few other venues within our solar system. But I have to report to you, to be honest, I believe there's no chance of advanced intelligent life anywhere within our solar system. There's just no sign of it at the present time, and I think we would have seen uh, such intelligence if it were there. So we have to look elsewhere to find out what types of planets uh, and venues might be suitable for intelligent life elsewhere in our universe. And so I'm going to launch ourselves into the Milky Way galaxy 
with its 200 billion stars and tell you what we've been trying to do, we meaning astronomers in general, to get a handle on habitable worlds elsewhere in our galaxy. The way that we've been successful so far in detecting planets around other stars is shown in this movie. We can't actually see the planets directly, even with the Hubble Space Telescope. They're lost in the glare of the host star. So instead, we punt and watch the star itself. And you see that stars actually wobble in space as they are yanked gravitationally by the planets going around them. So this star in this animation is wobbling around with a reflex motion because the unseen planet is pulling gravitationally as it orbits. We should be able to see that motion of the star in response to the planet. And the way we do it is to use an effect that all of you are familiar with, the Doppler effect. In the Doppler effect, as you know, uh, if you're standing next to a train tracks, you hear the train whistle change its pitch. You hear the train sound like this. You can tell even with your eyes closed that the train is a coming or a going from the change in the wavelengths of sound as the train comes at you compressing the sound waves and then the train recedes away from you stretching those sound waves. And so it is with light waves. We can actually watch light waves as a star is coming toward us or away from us and watch the light waves change their wavelengths, stretching and compressing as the star is a coming and going. And we see it in the form of the colors of the rainbow, the wavelengths of white light, shifting from the blue and to the red and back to the blue again. We can actually detect this at the back of a telescope. And that's in fact exactly what we do. If we can do this, then you might Im imagine asking, well, could we detect the wobble of our sun due to the planets going around our sun, yanking on it? And the answer is yes, our Earth pulls gravitationally on the sun, just as we all learned that the Earth is held to the sun by gravity. Jupiter, of course, yanks on the sun even more strongly, being a bigger planet. And so if you were to make measurements from Tau Ceti of our sun, you would make a graph as shown here. The velocity of our sun measured by the Doppler effect over the course of time, 1960, 1970, 1980, up to 2020. And you would indeed see that our sun is wobbling, changing its velocity high, low, high, low, high, low, with about a 12-year period from one peak to the next. 12 years is, in fact, the duration that Jupiter takes orbiting the sun once. As it does so, the sun does a little Irish jig in space in response. And of course, you can see that these uh, waves here, this change in velocity, is not uniform. Some of the peaks are higher than others. And that's because there are the other planets in the solar system also yanking on our sun. And so from uh, a distant star, you would be able to infer the presence of the planets orbiting our sun from the effect they have gravitationally on our sun. So that's the game to play, measure the Doppler shift and look for this reflex velocity. Of course, to do so, you need the world's largest telescopes to gather the light to measure this shift. We are lucky uh, to have access to some, indeed, of the world's largest telescopes. Lick Observatory, I hope many of you have visited. It's visible from here at Foothill College, right up in the uh, hills east of here on Mount Hamilton. You should all visit, if you haven't been, to Lick Observatory, a real gem of a science institution right in our midst. Um, there's also uh, a southern telescope we use, the Anglo-Australian telescope, from which we can search for planets around southern stars, not visible from the northern hemisphere here. And then finally, we're lucky to use the world's largest telescope, the Keck telescope, located on the uh, big island of Hawaii. Uh, perhaps you've been there as well. It's located high atop a uh, hopefully dormant volcano called Mauna Kea. So with those three telescopes, we are searching for planets, but the real gem in hunting for them is the spectrometer. At the back of these telescopes, we remove the eyepiece and replace it 
with a $10 million set of optics shown here schematically. At the back of the telescope right here, the light comes down, originally white light, and it gets spread out by a spectrometer into all of its composite colors or wavelengths of light. And it comes to a focus at a digital camera at the back. We record the spectrum of colors and it looks like this at the telescope. This is exactly what we see at the telescope. All the colors of the rainbow from any star's original white light. And you can even see some dark areas where the light from the star has been absorbed by atoms and molecules in the atmosphere of that star. Now, this is the digital camera image of the spectrum of a star, and the Doppler effect looks like this. If you come back a month later to the telescope, you might see the spectrum shift. Another month later, perhaps shift again. Another month, shift again. If the star is really being orbited by a planet, the planet turns the corner and goes the other way, and so the shift should go back and over and over again repeat in a periodic way, showing you that over the course of months and years, there is indeed a planet orbiting that star, yanking on the star, causing it to do all of this. Now, let me take a moment and tell you that I have fibbed a little bit. The actual amount of Doppler shift is something like 100,000 times smaller than what I just showed you. These dark spectral lines of which you may be able to see dozens or hundreds of them from your seats out there, they do indeed Doppler shift back and forth, but they shift by only about one one thousandth of one pixel on the digital camera image. And you might ask yourself, how in the world could you ever see these dark lines or the spectrum in general shift by one one thousandth of just one of the pixels on the digital camera? And the answer is shown in the next movie here. You zoom in on any one of these absorption lines, like say that one, and when you magnify it, you can see that spectral line Doppler shift to the left and to the right and to the left and to the right. And as it does so, the amount of light hitting the neighboring pixels that you see shown here by the pistons, the amount of light changes in each of those neighboring pixels as it gets covered up by a dark spectral line and then revealed and covered up again. And so the difficult challenge of measuring Doppler shifts at a thousandth of a pixel is met by simply measuring the amount of light in each neighboring pixel extremely precisely. And that means you need a lot of light so that the fractional error in the amount of light in each pixel is very tiny. So that's the game plan. Gather a lot of light, spread it out into all of its wavelengths, and measure this Doppler effect. Now let me show you some actual results. This is one of our stars that we've been monitoring at Lick Observatory just 25 miles from here. Star 16 Cygni in the constellation Cygnus. You can see it with your naked eye. And I've shown a plot here of the Doppler shift measured velocity of the star, this reflex velocity, in meters per second over the course of time, 94, 96, 98, 2000, up to 2006. You're seeing about 12 years. Let me show you back in 1994 the measurements that we obtained. You can see three data points. Each dot represents a visit to the telescope. We opened the shutter, we pointed at 16 Cygni, and measured the Doppler effect. You can see that these three data points are not in exact agreement, but like any good scientist, we are showing here the uncertainty in those measurements. You might be able to see, if you have very good eyes, a vertical bar, the error bar, in those Doppler shift measurements, which is our expected uncertainty in the measurement. And you can see that this point here is high by a little more than an error bar or two, giving us a hint that the star changed its velocity, but you really wouldn't be sure from just those three measurements. So we went back to the telescope the next year, and here's what we got. Now you see some Doppler shift measurements that are higher than others, giving you a suggestion that the star changed its velocity as if something were yanking on it, but you still can't tell much, and you are not even 100% sure that you should trust 
this variation in the velocity. So you should go back to the telescope again and take even more data. And now let me just show you the next 10 years of Doppler shift measurements. <coughs> it's quite striking that the Doppler shift varied in a predictable way. If you glance at this, you might be able to see with your own eyes a periodicity in the data. The velocity measurements go up and then down. The star's velocity increased and then the star was jerked downward and over and over again. The star repeatedly is being yanked around, undoubtedly due to the gravitational pull of some unseen planet and you can tell just by your own eyes there in the audience what the orbital period of that planet must be from one peak to the next peak is about two years, 2.2 years to be exact. So we know that there's a planet orbiting this star every 2.2 years yanking the star around. And there's another thing you learn right away from these data, the amount by which the star has been jerked, yanked around, this amplitude, the amount of velocity variation, if you read over here on the graph, 50 meters per second, half of a football field length per second is how fast the star is moving, and that velocity amplitude or wobble uh, immediately tells you how massive the planet must be. After all, a very massive planet is going to pull gravitationally more strongly on its host star than a small planet will. And so that velocity wobble can be interpreted using Newton's laws of physics that every freshman learns here at Foothill College and determine, I hope, and determine the mass of the planet that's doing this yanking. So in this case, uh, the inferred mass of the planet is 70% bigger than that of Jupiter. So this is a big planet, not too surprising. You can see this star wobbling with your own eye. So this is among the larger planets that we can find. Now, there's one thing about this graph that should be really bugging you. If it's not bugging you, think harder so that you're bugged. And, and what should be bugging you is that the, velocities, uh, the velocity of the star ramps upward, taking almost two full years, and then within about a week, the star's velocity is jerked downward, and then two more years go by or so, and then the star's velocity is jerked violently down again. And this is not what you would expect if the planet resided in a circular orbit around the star where you would get a more smooth, gentle variation in velocity. Instead, this planet must be orbiting the star in an elliptical orbit, bringing the planet so close to the star that it yanks gravitationally very strongly, and then the planet swings out wide, and then the planet comes in close again. And so the idea here is that from this shape of the velocity variation, you should be able to infer the shape of the orbit within which that planet resides. And so you can actually deduce something about the size and shape of the orbit, as well as the orbital period and the mass of the planet. And here's what you would get by, again, applying Newton's laws of physics. Here's the host star, 16 Cygni. For reference, there's our solar system with the inner four planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. And then here's our new planet, 16 Cygni b, uh, that you see indeed is in an elliptical orbit. It comes close to the star, and when the planet is very close to the star, it jerks violently by gravity on the star, yanking the star's velocity down to a lower value. So this is fantastic. I mean, I can't tell you how excited I am about uh, the way this all worked out. When we first started measuring Doppler shifts, we had no idea that it would be so illuminating. But now you can see you learn a lot about a planet, its existence, its mass, its orbital distance, the shape of the orbit, and the orbital period all from these uh, just simple Doppler shift measurements. Moreover, the farther the planet is from the host star, the cooler it will be in temperature. A planet close to the star will be hot. A planet very far from the star will receive very little of its host star light, and hence it will be quite a cool planet. So we can, in fact, estimate the temperature of a planet from data like these. So it's a fantastic amount of information that I'll come back to about whether such planets might be habitable or not. In this particular case, I think the chances for habitability are quite low, if I may be honest. It's a giant planet, bigger than Jupiter, 
And our own Jupiter, as you know, is composed primarily of hydrogen and helium gases, very little rocky uh, components at all. And it seems very hard to imagine single-celled life and indeed multicellular life existing on such a gaseous planet like this one, which is almost certainly also hydrogen and helium gas, because any life forms would sink in the gases down to the hot, dense interior and be crushed or melted to death. So I think life on these kind of planets seems like a, a, a long shot, but there are those who say it's not an impossibility. Maybe on a gaseous planet, you could have life forms that float, evolved to swim or fly like birds in the gaseous, indeed dense gaseous atmosphere. So we shouldn't rule out the possibility of life on gas giants entirely. Moreover, as shown in this artist's rendering by Lynette Cook, giant planets may have giant moons. And Lynette Cook has added one such moon. You see it shedding water because occasionally it comes so close to the star that it heats up, losing its water to evaporation. Nonetheless, it's possible that a massive enough moon could exist around a planet like this one, so massive that it retains its liquid water, and there could be lakes and oceans rendering this moon a suitable site for biology as we know it. So there are extraordinary questions being opened up by the discovery of new types of planets and the prospects of moons that might be themselves habitable. Wouldn't it be uh, amazing if it turned out that life in our universe predominantly lived on moons rather than on planets? Well, I now want to show you my favorite star in the whole sky. Um, here's a map. To, to help you find this star. It's, it's Upsilon Andromeda. There's a lot of stars here. And the way you find Upsilon Andromeda, it's up tonight, by the way. It's very easy uh, to find. You, you simply drive to the Andromeda galaxy, turn left, and uh, there's the star. You go a certain distance. You can find it among all the other stars because it has this, this arrow pointing right at it right there. <laughs> and without that, you have no chance. Here are the data. Uh, it looks like a mess. It's part of the reason I love this star uh, here's a, a graph, again, showing the measured Doppler shift derived velocity of the star over the course of time, starting in 1987, let me repeat that, 1987, all the way through 2006, the current time, and you can see that the data points scatter all over the place. You can't see any obvious periodicity here at all. So we use a technique called a Fourier analysis. Some of you have heard of Fourier analysis. We look for embedded invisible periodicities in the data. Instead of showing you a Fourier analysis right now, and I will show you one in a minute, another way of proceeding is to just zoom in on a little tiny piece of data like this little piece in here. And if you look very carefully at that piece, you see this. Now you're seeing only 70 days of data velocity measurements. And if you look at those 70 days of velocity measurements, the velocities went up and then down. And then here's another piece where they went down and then up and then down. And indeed, all of the points uh, can easily be fit on a very uh, wave-like, so-called sine wave of velocity variation, indicating that there is indeed a planet orbiting this star. The interesting thing, though, is the orbital period the distance from one peak to the next is only 4.6 days. So this is a planet that whips around its star, Upsilon Andromeda, taking only 4.6 days to go around once. One year is 4.6 days for that planet. Amazingly close in, obviously, planet, uh, and striking because we never expected originally such close in planets to exist. We now know of some 20 of them. In fact, the first a uh, planet found ever around another star by the Swiss team in Geneva uh, found a four-day planet around 51 Pegasi. So these planets are actually fairly common that are in close. In this case, however, that planet doesn't explain all of the data. If you subtract the effect of this very close-in planet around that star, Upsilon Andromeda, 
what's left over in the original velocity measurements is shown here. Here and now are the velocity residuals, what's left over, again in meters per second over the course of time. And you see that there is now still a velocity variation that takes about four years to wobble once. And superimposed on that is yet another wobble, a third wobble, that takes about two-thirds of a year. Every two-thirds of a year, the star wobbles due to some other planet. That is to say, there are a total of three planets orbiting this star that we've been able to detect. A triplet of planets, and here's the civil engineer's sketch of the system. You've got Upsilon Andromedae, you've got your inner planet, your middle planet, your outer planet. Of course, we know their orbits, the orbital shapes, and the masses of those planets. The outer one, four Jupiter masses, the middle one, two Jupiter masses, and the inner one, a mere 60% uh, of our Jupiter. Um, by the way, I should stop here and mention something that's a little sad. Um, we don't have names for any of our planets. Uh, we've never named them, and we're looking for some naming scheme. Maybe somebody would like to have a planet named after them, for example. But we just don't have any names for any of our planets yet, and, and we're looking for some strategy or uh, some technique by which some uh, type of a you know, poets or musicians or great scientists or something by which we can name the planets. Um, so it's, it's kind of an interesting challenge. How would you name the now 250 known planets around other stars? I should say that I get letters in the postal mail, however, suggesting names for our planets. And about a year ago, I remember getting a letter uh, from a 12-year-old girl in Idaho uh, and she said, Dear Professor Marcy, I'm a seventh grader in Idaho, and I, I learned about your new planetary system in our textbook. Um, I don't know if you've named your planets, and I'm still reading here. She said, But I have suggestions for you about how to name your planets around Upsilon Andromedae. Okay, so I keep reading. And she says, I think the outer planet should be named Forpiter. And she said, I think the middle one, I'm still reading, should be named Tupiter. Pretty good. And she said, the inner one, I think you should name that Dinky. So. <laughs> and there's great suggestions I get like that from whole classes of kindergartners who tell me what types of pizza the aliens like to eat on each of the planets. It's always pepperoni, every single time. It's always pepperoni. The other thing that's kind of, I remember getting a, a letter um, about a couple years ago uh, from a retired math professor. And... Uh, he sent me a postal mail also, didn't use email, I guess, and it says, Dear Professor Marcy, uh, I'm a retired math professor. I've come up with a mathematical proof that there's no intelligent life on the inner planet in the Upsilon Andromedae system. I thought, what kind of a mathematical proof? How could this be? So I keep reading. He says, What intelligent species would want to pay income taxes every 4.6 days? <laughs> mathematical proof. So here's what Lynette Cook thinks the system looks like. There's Upsilon Andromedae. There's uh, Forpiter and Tupiter and uh, Dinky. And, uh, and then Lynette Cook, with her artist's license gripped extra hard in her hand, has added something into this rendering for which we have, frankly, no evidence at all, namely a ring around this planet. Of course, it's a very logical addition on Lynette's part. Indeed, all of the giant planets in our solar system, not just Saturn, have rings around them. You may not have realized that. So it's quite imaginable that moons, comets, etc., get gravitationally ripped apart and turned into a smear of ring material around most of the giant planets in the universe. Quite logical. So that would be quite a spectacular uh, a concept. Imagine someday we humans send spacecraft to other planetary systems and observe for the first time the ring systems, the moons, comets, and asteroids around those planetary systems and how they differ from the same constructs in our own solar system. Well, here is uh, some data that we just released a couple of months ago, and I wanted to share it with you. This is a star in the constellation Cancer, star 55. You see, again, velocity over the course of time. And now you're seeing data again going back to 19, well, 88, 
Some 20 years ago, we started observing this star here at Lick Observatory, just up the road, and you see the data points. Now, if you look with your Fourier analysis glasses on, you can see a periodicity, a very long period planet, maybe taking some 14 years to go around the star. And if you have good eyes, you can imagine these velocity measurements must also be going up and down so fast that you can't even see the up and down wobble of the star. And so indeed we use a Fourier analysis. And I wanted to share with you what we actually look at. Here is a Fourier analysis of those velocity measurements that I just showed you. It's actually fairly easy to interpret these. Let me show you how you do it. Um, here are prospective orbital periods for planets we don't know whether they are or are not there on the horizontal axis, 10 days, 100 days, 1,000 days, 10,000 days. And then in the Fourier analysis, we are able to compute the amount of power, the probability, if you will, that such a periodicity exists in our velocity measurements. And you can see, sure enough, here's a lot of power at 14 years. Yes, you saw that with your naked eye, a 14-year wobble of the star. And now here, lo and behold, uh, is evidence for a planet taking only 14.6 days in this very tall spike of power that tells you that, yes, the up and down motion of that set of velocities was due to an inner planet taking two weeks to go around the star 55 Cancri. So there are two planets orbiting that star. We published this, we were very happy and smug, and we moved on. The problem is that when you build a model on the computer and predict what the wobble of the star should be based on these two planets, you get an answer that does not agree with our actual data points. And so you can look at the velocities that are left over, these residual velocities that I mentioned a minute ago, and do a Fourier analysis of them. And it turns out when you do that, you find that the leftover velocities have power at a period of 44 days. A third planet in this system. Okay, fine, we published that. You then build on the computer a model, a computer model of three planets yanking on the star. Look at the velocities that are left over and do a Fourier analysis of them. And lo and behold, there is now power at 2.8 days, 2.795 days to be exact. A fourth planet in the system, this one here is just a ringing effect of the uh, periodicity that's actually here. So there's in fact a fourth planet orbiting the star 55 Cancri. Now if you build a computer model with all four planets yanking on the star and look at the velocities that are left over between what you observe and what you predict from the computer, you see one last periodicity right here with a period of 260 days. And in fact, we were so shocked at this fifth apparent planet that we observed this star 55 Cancri both at Lick Observatory and in Hawaii at Keck, at the Keck Observatory, and we see this same fifth planet and all the other four planets as well at both telescopes. And at that point, a couple months ago, we felt confident to publish the paper Deborah Fisher uh, was the lead scientist on this. So this is an exciting result. We were rather surprised that it happened. It's a system of five planets orbiting 55 Cancri, the first quintuple planetary system ever found. And here's what it looks like. The 55 Cancri star is in the center. There are four planets packed in fairly close within about one Earth-Sun distance. And then the fifth planet which is fairly massive, about four times the mass of Jupiter, out here. And I thought you'd like to see how that planetary system compares to our own home solar system. Here's our Sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn out here. And so what's remarkable is that both of these planetary systems have four inner planets, indeed, they're fairly small in the 55 Cancri system, less than a Jupiter mass, and then a gap. And then after that gap, one massive gas giant planet. And who knows, maybe 55 Cancri has yet more planets that we simply don't have enough data to infer yet. So it's rather interesting that we're seeing what you might call kin 
of our solar system among planetary systems elsewhere in our Milky Way galaxy, giving us a suggestion that indeed the laws of physics and chemistry have reproduced another planetary system that has some uh, kinship with our own. Now, here's what the system looks like in Lynette Cook's uh, from her paintbrush. You see uh, 55 Cancri, an inner planet, a second one, a third one. There's a fourth one that I can't, it's right in here, you can barely see it. And then the fifth one, here they are magnified, star, inner planet, second, three, four, and five. Five planets uh, going around the star. By the way, one fun thing you can do, uh, don't do this at home though, take, take a hammer and smash all of these planets uh, and smear out their material and you can smear them out into the original platter of gas and dust out of which the planets themselves originally formed, the protoplanetary disk out of which they formed, and therefore we can reconstruct the original material around the young star 55 Cancri when those planets first formed. So this is giving theoretical astrophysicists a lot of tools to understand the planet formation process. Um, now, NASA loves this system too, so I thought I would show you an animation of what NASA thinks this planetary system looks like. So I'm going to take you on a trip here. Here's the constellation Cancer with 55 Cancri in here. And now you're going to take a flight through our solar system, then out toward Cancer, and you'll see the 55 Cancri planetary system. Here's our solar system, and here's 55 Cancri. You'll see all five planets in succession. Notice that the planets have colors. That one's blue, that one's brown. We have absolutely no idea what the colors of these planets are. <laughs> None whatsoever that didn't stop NASA one bit. Um, to be fair, Neptune is bluish. Uranus is somewhat bluish. Jupiter and Saturn have a yellowy brown tint to them, and we know why there are molecules in the atmospheres that give the planets their color when light scatters off of those molecules. So it's not ridiculous that the planets would have these colors, but frankly, we, we just don't know. We, to this day, don't have any pictures of any of the planets that we've discovered. So this is exciting. We're seeing kindred planetary systems, and this leads me to, I think, the most exciting topic. Um, that uh, is really capturing my attention in my own research, and that is how many Earths are out there in our Milky Way galaxy. I have to report to you with our current technology, we cannot yet detect Earth-like planets. We can estimate how many there might be, and here's how you would do it. Remember that our Milky Way galaxy contains 200 billion stars. Our survey has shown that about 10% of those stars have large planets like Jupiter and Saturn and Neptune that we can detect. So if you multiply 10% of all the stars by 200 billion, you very quickly realize that our Milky Way galaxy contains some 20 billion planetary systems at a minimum. Because of course we can only detect the Jupiters, Saturns, and Neptunes. Who knows how many smaller Earth-like, Mars-like, Venus-like planets are out there, perhaps more numerous. And indeed I would suggest they probably are more numerous, the small planets are, than the larger planets. So, Right away, you can estimate that there are tens of billions of rocky, Earth-like planets out there uh, among the stars, just within our Milky Way. That then leads to a very important and difficult question. Among those tens of billions of Earths, how many of them are suitable for life, at least life as we know it? How many of the Earths are habitable? Well, that begs the question, what do you mean by a habitable planet? What are the properties, the environmental conditions of a planet that render it habitable in the first place? Well, we don't know too much, but we're learning. And it's the biologists, not the astronomers, who are telling us the answer. And what the biologists have done is very clever. They have ascertained the habitability of the Earth, our own Earth, by going to the least hospitable place on the planet Earth, and among the least hospitable places on our planet is, in fact, the great national park, Yellowstone. It's inhospitable because the water is coming out at boiling temperatures, 
During the winter, Yellowstone is covered by tens of feet of snow, as it is right now. And moreover, the water comes out highly acidic. So the biologists have gone to Yellowstone for about 20 years now, studying how it is that life can survive in this hideous, inhospitable environment. And you might go yourself and take a look and see how life survives. Here's one example of a geyser spewing out boiling water coming off in this stream here. And you'll see in most of the streams in Yellowstone, different colors of the water. Well, of course, it's not the water that has different colors. It turns out there are different species of critters, microbes, bacteria, that live in the water. And as the water comes off, it cools off at different rates. And so there are different temperature streams in each of these curves. And there's a different species of bacterium that thrives in that temperature domain. And so you see dark green, yellow bacteria, uh, red bacteria, orange and brown bacteria. These are bacteria with different pigments that only live in a little niche of temperature. And so you can actually see uh, the specificity of their environments within which they thrive. And remember, the water is coming out very hot. You can bring a thermometer to Yellowstone and measure the water. It's you know 150 degrees Fahrenheit, 170 degrees Fahrenheit. The bacteria thrive with no trouble. And moreover, the water, as I said, is highly acidic. To prove this to yourself, if you don't believe biologists, go back to your high school chemistry teacher's lab steal some of, the, I mean, borrow some of the pH paper that you remember using in your high school chemistry class and take that pH paper and dunk it into the water there in Yellowstone. And you can do that. When you do so, you find out, even as an amateur biologist, the pH is 2 on a scale of 1 to 14. So in fact, the water is battery acid-like in its acidity, and yet there are bacteria like this beautiful angel hair-like filamentous bacteria thriving, as well as many hundreds of types of bacteria and algae thriving in this boiling, acidic water that gets snowed on every winter. In fact, I got to tell you my most favorite place, I brought a couple of slides of it in Yellowstone. This is called Churning Cauldron. You have to take a hike for about a half an hour to get to this place. Look at the water burgling and gurgling up as it's boiling to the surface. I wanted to measure the pH to check on my biologist friends of this thing, churning cauldron, but I didn't dare plunk my finger anywhere near that water lest I maybe pull out a stump. So instead, I tied the pH paper to a black metal clip and tied the black metal clip to a string, and I tossed the pH paper into the water, and here's what uh, you pull out when you do that little exercise. Uh, there's what was a black clip. It's no longer black. Uh, and the pH paper indeed shows two, a battery acid-like uh, acidity. And then as if to laugh in our human faces, algae was drawn up on the string. Right here, the green algae, thriving wonderfully uh, within that hideous uh, boiling water. There are dozens of species of bacteria that also live in churning cauldron. They are partying in there uh, and indeed if hell ever does freeze over I think there will be species of bacteria that will find that perfectly pleasant as well. So um, they're partying while we would shudder at the notion of uh, such living conditions but the message these bacteria are sending us uh, the message is extraordinarily profound for astronomy, because these species are telling us that no matter the temperature, what the acidity or alkalinity, whether there's sunlight beaming down on them or whether they are in darkness, they will still thrive. There will be some species of bacteria through Darwinian evolution find that niche and thrive in that environment as long as there's liquid water. Wherever there's liquid water on the earth, you'll find species that take advantage of it. So, there's no question, I think, in most biologists' mind, and I have to admit, even in my own mind, that in our Milky Way galaxy, maybe within 10 or 20 light years of us, are planets that harbor bacteriological, single-celled, microbial life
thriving in whatever conditions are on that planet as long as there's water. And I have very good reason to suspect, because water is such a popular molecule in the universe, that there's plenty of liquid water on many of the terrestrial planets elsewhere in our Milky Way. So the only remaining question is whether or not Darwinian evolution normally and inexorably leads to intelligence. Is intelligent life a normal outcropping byproduct of evolution, starting with simple life? Now, this is a question we can't answer very well. I'll walk you through the very simple argument that tells us that intelligent life ought to be common as well. And here's the argument. You know now that there are 20 billion planetary systems within our Milky Way. Many of them are quite old compared to our sun. Remember, our sun is only 4.6 billion years old, and our galaxy is about 10 billion years old. So there must be some Earths out there that have been around for a billion or two longer years than our own Earth has been around. And so that leads to the question of all of those Earths that are out there, what fraction of them spawns intelligent life eventually? Well, nobody knows the answer to this. You can ask evolutionary biologists at Harvard University uh, whether or not single-celled life will normally evolve into critters with big brains and who are arrogant like us, and you, 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 they can't tell you the answer. Um, the least optimistic answer I've ever heard is that intelligent life is a one in a million throw of the dice. Okay, if it's one in a million, you can do the math. One in a million out of 20 billion tells you immediately that our Milky Way galaxy must contain thousands, indeed probably tens of thousands, of civilizations, and indeed many of them advanced by millions or maybe even billions of years beyond the technology of our own civilization. So we would expect thousands of these great civilizations out there just within our Milky Way galaxy alone. This result is, I think, no surprise to any of us. It's certainly no surprise to the science fiction writers uh, and the science fiction filmmakers who've been telling us for decades that the Romulans and the Klingons are so numerous out there that they need stoplights to avoid running into each other. Uh, and, you know, you got to go out, go out there with some caution lest maybe they're hungry. So that's the premise that we've all grown up with as children. The problem, though, is a profound one. If our galaxy is in fact teeming with thousands of advanced civilizations with their great uh, probes that scatter uh, and investigate our whole galaxy, where are they? Why hasn't any of them apparently come here, left a camera on the moon, an obelisk, some seismometer, some sort of a, a instrument that we would recognize as technology. There are, to be sure, footsteps on the moon, but they're ours, no one else's. That's puzzling. Without any erosion on the moon, we're the only footsteps there. Similarly, we've photographed Mars to quite fine detail. No scientific instruments, no obelisks, no sign that any advanced species came, left some trace of its existence. And I think the greatest galactic flytrap that we know of is the Earth. Clearly an advanced civilization many light years away would have taken a picture of the Earth, seen that it's a Shangri-La with palm trees, beachfront property, set up a golf course here or a resort hotel. This could be a great vacation destination for the folks at Tau Ceti, but they didn't. They never came here. It's true that the humans, uh, you know, we humans might represent such a precious commodity that maybe they're protecting us, but we've only been here on the Earth for a blink of an eye the last two million years. In all of the four billion year history of our Earth, no other advanced species came and set up a resort hotel on the Earth, nor left any trace that they ever came here. None that we all agree on, scientifically anyway, came here, UFOs aside. So it's very puzzling that a galaxy teeming with intelligent life has left essentially no trace. The Romulans and the Klingons and even the Galactic Federation, according to Star Trek, power their spaceships with matter-antimatter engines. Where's the gamma ray exhaust that we would see with our gamma ray telescopes? 
We don't see them. The night sky shows no great spaceships crisscrossing our solar system. We don't see even robotic probes sort of orbiting Mars or orbiting the Earth, watching what we do century after century. It's a little puzzling that a galaxy so teeming with life has hidden itself apparently so successfully. And as Jill Tarter will discuss in the upcoming uh, Foothill Lecture Series lecture, the SETI searchers, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence scientists, have looked very hard for 40 years, and let's all hope they continue looking for another century. But so far, not detected any radio or television transmissions picking up their spillover uh, military or uh, telecom communications from one civilization to the next, one spacecraft to the next. We haven't picked up any of that transmission. So there's a growing list of what you might call non-detections of the advanced civilizations that we imagine we could have detected were they actually there. So we need to be honest. We need to suggest that perhaps Gene Roddenberry uh, uh, didn't quite have it right. Maybe the number of advanced civilizations is not as great, or maybe indeed space travel is not as easy as is depicted in science fiction. And it's still puzzling, despite all of that as a possibility, that they've been overly optimistic, because of course we humans have already sent small robotic probes that have left our solar system. Pioneer, Voyager, they're leaving, and they're gonna go out for tens of thousands of years, and if we humans continue to send out a probe every couple of years that leaves our solar system, we ourselves will be populating, let's say, our galaxy with probes. If the galaxy is filled with advanced civilizations, why aren't some of them, at least, doing the same thing? They could have, and we would see their effects. So it's puzzling that the uh, galactic ants have not come to our kitchen yet. Now, one possibility for the absence or the apparent absence of advanced civilizations is that if you indeed expect thousands of them to have existed in our Milky Way galaxy during the past, let's say, five billion years, then of course, in order for one civilization to overlap in time, the next civilization and the next civilization, they have to last long enough for one civilization to overlap the next one. And if you do the math, a thousand civilizations spread out over five billion years means that civilizations better darn well last a few million years in order for one of them to overlap the next one that comes along. And that begs the question, how long does a civilization last that has high technology, the ability to build radio telescopes, spacecraft, and of course, weapons? So we don't know whether or not, uh, in fact, our galaxy had been populated with civilizations long gone, and that we just are not lucky enough to be overlapping one at the present time. Perhaps our galaxy is like some sort of galactic Christmas tree, where the lights flicker on, flicker off, another light flickers on, flickers off, and it's rare for two or three of the Christmas lights to be on simultaneously at any given time. So that may serve as some kind of a challenge for humanity. We have a very serious challenge to somehow last long enough to overlap and therefore be able to communicate with our galactic brethren. With that rather depressing note, there is an optimistic point of view. And the optimistic point of view is that life is probably common in our galaxy and elsewhere in the universe, at least simple life, because the petri dishes exist in the billions. The uh, building blocks of life are abundant. We certainly know that water exists in comets, in between the stars, in galactic clouds, and water exists on many different planets, even within our solar system, often in the form of ice and sometimes liquid water. So there's no question that the uh, elements that life depends on are abundant. The power exists in the stars, geothermal energy, of course, tidal energy. So I think there's no question 
that life is a common property of other planets, other moons, at least primitive life, maybe cockroaches and so on, are common. But what we don't know is whether or not habitable planets spawn intelligent life. So we're beginning to look now seriously for truly Earth-like habitable planets. And the best way we're going to find habitable planets is with a NASA mission that is being built about five miles from right here. At NASA Ames Research Center, the Kepler mission will launch in one year, February 2009. What that mission will do is look at nearby stars to see if they dim as the planets orbit in front of those stars, blocking some of the starlight. What a clever idea. Just watch the stars and see if they dim when an Earth crosses in front. And this Kepler telescope will have a digital camera in the back watching to measure the brightnesses of stars to look for Earth-like planets. We hope to find somewhere between 200 and 400 Earth-like planets with the Kepler mission, the first Earths ever found. That will be very exciting. In addition, at Lick Observatory, on the top of Mount Hamilton, we're building a new telescope dedicated to finding Earth-like planets. Here's what it looks like right now with snow on the ground at Mount Hamilton, if you've been up there this winter. Um, here's another close-up view of our new telescope. This will measure the Doppler shifts of nearby stars so precisely and so frequently that we'll be able to detect Earth-like planets orbiting the stars, yanking gravitationally on them. Here's a simulation of what our data should look like. Velocity over the course of one summer here in the San Jose area, and we'll see the stars wobble. Uh, here's the Fourier power spectrum. We'll see the stars wobble as a planet of a few Earth masses yanks on that host star. So with both the Kepler mission and this telescope on Mount Hamilton, we're pulling out all the stops to find out if other Earths are common in our galaxy and what their temperatures are, their orbits, whether they have any similarity to our own Earth. That begs the most exciting question of all. If you find an Earth, what do you do? Well, it's pretty obvious what you should do. Get all of your friends who have radio telescopes and radio dishes and point them at that Earth and try to pick up the summer reruns of I Love Lucy coming from that planet, thereby telling you that there's no intelligent life there at all. Um, but maybe there will be something more intelligent than that. And in fact, the SETI Institute, located right here a few miles away, in partnership with UC Berkeley, is building a vast array of radio telescopes funded by Paul Allen of Microsoft, funding the uh, construction of dozens and hopefully hundreds of these radio dishes with one primary purpose. Point them at a nearby Earth-like planet and try to pick up radio or television transmissions from any civilization that might be there. It's very, I think, tear-jerkingly compelling to imagine that within our lifetimes, we may learn of other advanced civilizations that are out there uh, wondering whether there's any civilization here on the Earth, and I'm sure that Jill Tarter will describe their efforts to use this radio telescope at that next uh, lecture that she's giving. And we can only hope that by exploring the issues of biology along with astronomy, maybe within our lifetimes we'll learn some of these answers. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Marcy. And now uh, Dr. Marcy has indeed agreed to answer questions. We do ask you to ask questions and not make speeches. Um, and there are microphones in the middle of the hall where we ask you to line up. And then I might, I'm going to ask Dr. Marcy to recognize them fairly in turn, one and the other. And we'll continue for a while with formal questions. So thank you so much for an illuminating talk. We, we're delighted to hear all the latest news, including Tupiter and Forpiter. And now I hand you over to the audience. Yes. Um, has the uh, Fourier analysis, has that been done in detail for our solar system? Have you detected evidence of the shift from other planets after you take out the effect of Jupiter? Uh, yes. In fact, uh, the planets in our solar system all have to be accounted for in our measurements because just as you suggest, 
uh, Jupiter and the other planets yank on our sun and indeed yank on the Earth. So when we make Doppler measurements of other stars, we have to first subtract away the effect of all the motion uh, of our own Earth, some of which is caused by the pull from the other planets, before we then come up with our final Doppler shift measurements. The Jet Propulsion Laboratory, by the way, is the uh, source of that information. They tell us what the motion of the Earth is due to all the other bodies in our solar system. Yeah. Yeah, for both the Kepler mission and, and the Doppler shift, what effect does the plane of the orbit of the planet uh, have an effect on, on your measurements? Yeah, that's a great question. For our Doppler shift measurements, if the orbital plane of the planet around the star is seen edge on, we get the maximum Doppler effect. The star wobbles toward us and away from us, toward us and away from us. If, however, the orbital plane is tilted 20 degrees or 40 degrees or 60 or even worse, 90 degrees, a face on orbit, then the star and the planet wobble in a plane uh, that is up and down or left and right or both, and we don't see any approach or recession of the star at all. And so we would miss the detection of any such planets. That's exactly right. In the case of the Kepler mission, it's even worse. Because in their case, for Kepler, the planet has to be in a plane exactly lined up or nearly exactly lined up with the, our Earth so that the planet actually sits right in front of the star. If the orbital plane is tipped just a little bit, the planet won't block the starlight, so you won't detect any of the planets. Indeed, the Kepler mission will be studying 100,000 stars with the full knowledge that only about one in a hundred of the planetary systems will be adequately seen edge on to allow detection of, of the Earth-like planets. Yeah. I uh, have been to your lecture a couple of times before, and uh, the uh, new telescope on Mount Hamilton is a new element. You uh, <laughs> said before that uh, with your Doppler shift method, you can't really get down to the Earth-like planets. So has your uh, algorithm uh, been improved? And uh, also, how can you build something better than Keck? Uh, up? That's a very good question. How can you beat Keck? And the answer, of course, we're still using Keck, and we still need this new telescope. Here's the answer. Um, for one thing, our technology is improving. We now can measure the Doppler shift of a star, the speed of a star, to plus or minus one meter per second. So I can tell you whether a star is moving this fast. Or, if you, or away from you at just that speed. It's rather amazing, a star 100 light years away. We can tell you whether it's strolling toward us or, or away from us. So that's one thing. The real advantage of this dedicated telescope at Lick Observatory is that we own it ourselves. The University of California owns it. We will observe stars every single night. A single star, we'll observe it every night. We'll have a host of 50 stars. Observe them every night. And the advantage is, is, is really wonderful. If there's an Earth-like planet in a close-in orbit, taking, say, 30 days to go around the star, you need to watch that star every day, every night, I should say, for 30 straight nights, and preferably 60 or 90 nights. We only get a few nights on the Keck telescope. So as large as the Keck is, we have to share it with so many other people that we can't watch with high enough cadence to detect close-in Earths, and that's the advantage. Yeah. Dr. Marcy, you indicated about a tenth of the stars that you observe might have large planets that you can detect. I wonder, uh, to better understand on a given night, say at Lick Observatory, um, if, you, if observing time wasn't a question, how many stars are above your intensity threshold? And uh, basically, how many planets like, do you think you could detect on, uh, from, the, from that sky? And how does that compare to, uh, like, would there be a thousand visible stars to the naked eye? Yeah, you actually, you hit the nail on the head. Um, at the Keck telescope, we can observe stars as faint as eighth magnitude, for those of you who know the magnitude system. And there are several thousand stars brighter than eighth magnitude that are normal uh, hydrogen-burning stars amenable to the Doppler measurements. So we wish we were monitoring all of the several thousand stars uh, that are bright enough, as you say, to, uh, to allow these Doppler measurements to occur. Moreover, we wish we could make the Doppler measurements once a week 
twice a week or at least two or three times a month. In fact, we don't get telescope time that often, which is part of the reason we're trying to build this new one. Um, so typically, the bad news is most of the stars, and we are monitoring 2,000 of them, most of them we are able to observe only twice a year. So any planets that take a few months to go around the star, we will miss most of them because the planet goes around and around and we've been gone. And then we come back to the telescope and get a snapshot of the Doppler shift. So, you know, your, your bottom line answer is we are starved for telescope resources to find the Neptunes and indeed the Earths that we otherwise could find if we had more uh, telescopes at our disposal. And in the end, it's funding. If we had more funding, we could build more telescopes like this new one at Lick Observatory that finally will give us a chance to find Earths. Thanks very much. Yeah. It's been theorized that life on Earth was possible because we have gas giants in our solar system that, right. that block off intense bombardment over a long period of time. The fact that you found gas giants in other solar systems would encourage the fact that there may be habitable planets because of that. Would you expand on that? Maybe? Yeah, it's a brilliant comment. Um, and just to fill in the, some of the details, we now believe that um, when our solar system first formed, there were thousands of times more comets and asteroids than there are today. But in the intervening four and a half billion years, Jupiter, the big gravitational bully in our solar system, slingshot out by its gravity most of the asteroids and comets, or indeed maybe sucked those asteroids and comets into Jupiter or flung them into the sun, thereby cleansing the solar system of that early solar system debris. If that were not the case, if Jupiter didn't exist, we would be bombarded by comets and asteroids every few months, as was the case in the early, part, early era of the solar system. And indeed, most of you know that the dinosaurs were probably wiped out by a giant impact some 60 million years ago or so. So indeed, it's probably true that we owe our existence, and indeed most of the mammalians on the planet Earth, at least the larger ones, owe their existence to the presence of Jupiter. So as you say, the fact that we've found a fair number of Jupiters out there gives us hope that uh, similar cosmic vacuum cleaners are out there to do their job. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to follow up on your question about the off-axis orbits. And are there ways you can even detect that? Or the, the pictures we see in the common press, even the ones you showed up here, say, oh, it's a four-mass Jupiter. But that's really sort of the, if there's no way to tell if it's off-axis, the minimum mass, and all these pictures of what the layout looks like and how similar it is, seems to me like that's taking a lot of leap of faith on saying it's an on-axis view. If it's off-axis, all they can be much larger, much larger changing orbit. Are there signals there that tell you that it is on-axis versus being very eccentric? Or ox so um, you're overly pessimistic, but you're on the right track, so let me, let me try to give you my sense of it all. You're absolutely right that because we don't know the tilt of the orbit, we actually only learn the, uh, a lower limit to the mass of the planet. If the planet's orbit, orbital plane is tipped 30 degrees, the planet's mass will be a little bit bigger, 20, say, percent bigger than what I was quoting. And in fact, the average tilt, about 45 degrees, tells you that the masses of the planets we found, on average, are about 30 percent more massive than that minimum mass, just from statistics of the various orientations of the orbital planes. That's not too bad. You're welcome to multiply all of the masses I mentioned, increment them by 30 percent, and instead of 1.8 Jupiter masses, they're 2.3 Jupiter masses or something. So that's not a big problem. The other thing that you mentioned, though, is, is too pessimistic. The actual sizes of the orbits and the shapes of the orbits, those we learn unambiguously independent of the tilt of the plane. So uh, in brief, that information and indeed the temperature of the planet owing to its distance from the star, we learn unambiguously as well. So everything except the mass is nailed down and even the mass, even if it's, you know, if it's off by 20 or 30 percent, it doesn't matter that much. Yeah. I have a comment on where the aliens are. Uh, I, was, uh, I was mission scientist on Apollo 14 
and the, the, the command module pilot, Stu Russo, and I tried very hard to get the landing site moved from Fra Maro over to a limb of the moon, near, nearer the limb. And the reason was that we'd asked ourselves, where would the aliens leave the obelisk? Uh -huh. And the obvious answer was in the middle of Oriental, the great bullseye, which is just around the corner. Uh, you'd never see it from the Earth. We wouldn't know it was there until we got space flight, but it, once you see it, it's, it covers most of the disk of the moon. But uh, unfortunately, the, landing, the lighting conditions required at the Apollo landing sites meant that it was always in the dark during every Apollo mission. Ah. And Stu and I were trying to get them to shift it so that, that Oriental would be lit up and he could take some photographs of the, of the center of the place. We, uh, we didn't get it done. We were too embarrassed to tell them what the real reason was. But, <laughs> but, but the, and the, the result was... Probably wise on your part. <laughs> <laughs> the result of that is that we still don't have pictures of, of the center of Oriental at anything like the resolution that he could have taken, so we still well, don't know. I, that's fascinating. I, I'm, I'm very appreciative of your comment, and I think, if I may just expound on this, um, we certainly do want the most detailed pictures of the moon down to a resolution of a few inches in case uh, the seismometers left by the aliens you know, are pocket-sized. And similarly for Mars, which I consider a little more compelling, um, we don't have very high resolution images of the entire surface of Mars at the sort of one foot or one inch level. So there's a real reason to have rovers on Mars, to have pictures of Mars, to look for any evidence of some past civilization that came, you know, and, and left uh, their picnic basket there. <laughs> yes? What's the uh, maximal tilt that you could, that your methods would work to detect planets? Sorry, what's the... Oh, the tilt of the ecliptic. Uh, oh, how could we determine the tilt of the orbital plane? No, what's... Your, if, it's, if it were face-on, then we can't see anything. Yeah. But I just wonder how far could it be where you can still detect things using your methods? Well, the wonderful thing about this... I assume. It, yeah, well, the wonderful works. thing about the Doppler shift method is that no matter how far away the star is, if you can measure the Doppler shift repeatedly, you can determine whether there are planets. So the real restriction is brightness. Stars that are too faint uh, don't give us enough light, enough photons, to fill up the pixels with enough light, as you saw in that animation, to measure the Doppler shift very precisely. So stars that are fainter than 10th magnitude with the Keck telescope, we labor, we struggle, we take 15 or 20 minutes. Time is ticking by, we could be doing other stars. Fainter stars still, we don't bother with them because they're so expensive of telescope time that it costs us too much time to observe that faint star. So the answer to your question is we could do tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of stars in our galaxy and watch for planets if we had enough telescope time to do them. But in the end, we restrict ourselves to the brightest and hence the closest of the stars. So the brightness is the limitation, the not brightness so much is the, the angle. Limitate. Exactly. Like if it were bright enough, even for 80%, That's you could right. still detect it. That's right, exactly. Okay, thanks. Yeah. I have uh, two questions. One is, um, do you uh, pre-select stars so that you use very stable stars? Because a lot of stars pulsate, and they will have periods just due to the atmosphere move movement. That's my first question. Oh, well, I'll answer it. Um, yes, uh, we avoid pulsating stars. RR Lyrae's, Cepheid variables, even giant stars, so-called red giants, uh, have surface motions, undulations that mimic Doppler shifts with some kind of periodicities in them. So we avoid all of those stars. And that's why you heard me say parenthetically, we concentrate our study uh, of just stars that are nearly sun-like somewhat more massive than the sun, somewhat less massive, but normal uh, hydrogen burning uh, quiescent stars that are indeed not undulating, as you say. Yeah, makes sense. And the second question is, in order to uh, get the Doppler shift, such small shifts in wavelength, a thousandth of a pixel, Right. whenever you take a spectrum, you need a, a, um, a reference ah. source. You have to have an extremely stable reference source yeah. in order to measure. What do you use? Yeah. Iodine. Iodine? A uh, whole part of the story, it's a great question. We actually insert into our telescopes, Lick, Keck, Anglo Australian Telescope, a glass bottle filled with iodine gas. 
at a fixed temperature, 50 degrees Celsius. And we force the starlight to pass through that iodine gas. And the starlight that emerges has spectral lines in it, not just from the star, but also from the iodine. Those iodine lines do not participate in the Doppler effect, and so we use them as the reference lines of known wavelength, as just exactly as you said, against which to measure the Doppler shift of these stellar spectral lines. Thanks. Yeah. I noticed in uh, one of your slides that was indicating the Fourier spectrum of the planets right. that there seemed to be a pretty strong uh, set of side lobes yes. along one of the uh, planetary peaks. That's right. I was wondering, what is that indicative of? It, could that be some second order uh, you know, effect? You, you know what it is? It's a stroboscopic effect that we're all familiar with if you've ever watched hubcaps uh, of a car driving along with fluorescent bulbs. You sometimes see that the wheels almost seem to be going backwards. What happens is we measure the Doppler shift every night, night after night after night. The stroboscope is the nightly cadence of our measurements, uh, analogous to the flickering of fluorescent lights that strobe on and off. And so if the <clears throat> planet has an orbital period of, let's say, 3.4 days, and we only observe it every night, we actually see the orbital phase of the planet, the actual position of the planet when we make our measurements at certain instants of time. And it might almost appear that the orbital period is a little different than we think it is. Or in other words, other apparent periodicities can emerge from the data that are artificial and due entirely to this stroboscopic effect of our forced nightly observations. And so that the other peaks that you saw there, as you called them correctly, side lobes, are due to our uh, nightly observations and also monthly observations. We tend to observe uh, you know, at the same phase of the moon, frankly near new moon, because our stars are bright enough to handle it. So we have a nightly cadence and a monthly cadence and a yearly cadence because the stars go behind the sun uh, for half of the year. And because of those, those stroboscopic effects, we get some of those um, outlier uh, peaks that we can dismiss by, by modeling them. I see. I just. Yeah. Okay, only those that are now standing, I'm told. Yes. Okay, so let's assume that I am a, a member of an observatory on a, on a star in the Pegasus system. Okay. And I'm looking back at our solar system, this right. one right here, and I detect our Jupiter right. as, a, as a large planet, and I'm also fortunate to be able to detect Venus, Earth, and Mars. I cannot tell if there's life on any of those, and right. in fact, two, you know, two out of three don't have life. That's right. Um, so uh, we didn't find out that there was no life on Jupiter, uh, excuse me, on Venus and Mars until recently, until right. in my own lifetime. Right. So to be able to determine that there's a, a, pla a habitable planet that has life right. seems to be very remote. Yes. Um, <laughs> let, me, let me comment, though, to give you some hope. There, there are two, two things we have to do. One I mentioned point radio telescopes and look directly for advanced life. But more, I think, uh, uh, stepwise is to build a space-borne telescope. And indeed, NASA wants to build it. It's called the Terrestrial Planet Finder. A space-borne telescope like the Hubble, but it would probably have several telescopes all attached working in tandem as an interferometer to take pictures of those Earth-like planets. Notice we have no pictures of any of our planets. If you can take a picture of a planet, you can use the light, analyze it with a spectrograph, a spectrometer, and look to see if there are signatures of biology on that planet. Chlorophyll, for example, has a distinct spectral signature. You might look for methane uh, given off by, the, uh, by cow's flatulence and so on on that planet. So there are uh, ways that you might spectroscopically analyze the chemistry of another planet and at least make a reasonable guess as to whether there's life and what type of life might be there. So that's the real future in the 10 or 20 year time frame, a space-borne telescope that takes pictures of and spectra of Earth-like planets. Yeah. Does 55 Cancri planets have names? Okay, this is a very good question. 
The five planets around 55 Cancri have no names at all. Isn't that sad? I think you should try to come up with some names and send me a letter. And then in my next lecture, I'll tell the audience what names you gave those five planets, OK? All right. That's good. Yes. <laughs> good question. Um, have, has there been any, any planets discovered around binary or trinary systems? Yes, uh, there are about 20 planets now known around binary stars. One of them I, I even showed, 16 Cygni B, has a stellar companion. It was even shown in Lynette Cook's rendering, 16 Cygni A. Uh, and it's a system where the two stars are so far apart that, in fact, um, the planets can orbit one or the other star and the two stars don't gravitationally perturb the planets. Oddly, by the way, 16 Cygni B has the Jupiter that I showed in that sawtooth uh, velocity curve. 16 Cygni A has no planet at all that we can detect, no Jupiters anyway. So it's kind of odd that two stars formed at the same time out of the same material. One has a planet, the other one doesn't. Yes? I've been, ha I've been having a hard time imagining gas giant planets inside the orbit of Mercury lasting for two, four billion years. Do we know that they're gas giants? Could they be rocky cores, metallic cores? Any ideas? You know what? Um, we are absolutely positive that they're gas giants. And you might find that surprising to be so sure. But the reason is a few of these close-in giant planets have a mass about that of Jupiter. By luck, um, some of them indeed cross in front of the star blocking some of the starlight, and the amount of light that's blocked tells you the diameter of that planet. We already get the mass of the planet from this Doppler effect and the wobble of the star. Knowing the mass and the diameter of the planet allows us to determine the density. And it turns out that most of these giant planets have densities very similar to that of our own Jupiter, about one gram per cubic centimeter, uh, about that of water it's actually gas under high compression. So there's almost no doubt, I mean literally no doubt, that these are planets composed of hydrogen and helium with self-gravity compressing them down to densities very much the same as our own Jupiter and Saturn. Wow. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. Well, related to that question, what keeps the gas yeah. on the planet? Just the gravity alone? Yeah, I mean that was the other implied part okay. of his question. Thank you for reminding me of it. You might worry, as I think you were worried, that a close-in giant planet would be so close to the star that it would be, the planet would be blowtorched by the star to a very high temperature. That's true. And that at such a high temperature, the molecules would be racing around due to that high temperature so fast that some of the molecules would achieve escape velocity and leave the planet, allowing the planet to slowly but surely evaporate away. And it turns out you can do that calculation. That's second semester physics uh, in most colleges. And you can actually determine how fast the molecules are going at their equilibrium temperature and what the escape velocity of the planet is. Turns out the hydrogen and the helium uh, does not achieve escape velocity. The vast majority of it will just stay gravitationally bound to the planet. And so the planet actually remains intact for billions of years, despite its high temperature and its gaseous nature. Yeah. Um, you said there was a, uh, we saw a slide of an elliptical orbit of a planet. And right. you said that you didn't believe that there would be life on right. it. Right. <laughs> but, um, so do, how common are spherical orbits? Ah. And um, you, you also said that the laws of our uh, biology that we have on Earth might not apply. Um, doesn't that mean that uh, there could be life on yes. the elliptical? Yeah, I, it's, a, it's a really creative question. And I, have to, I didn't mention this. Uh, the vast majority, 85 or 90 percent of the planets we have discovered, of the 250 found by us and the Swiss team, 85 or 90 percent of them uh, reside in these elliptical, elongated orbits not circular orbits, as we find in our own solar system. So that's 
uh, a little frightening and puzzling. And as you suggest, it suggests that the temperature of the planet will vary. Hot, cold, hot, cold, as the planet gets close to and then far from the star. And when there are such wide temperature swings, you might imagine that biology would have a difficult time surviving, the water freezing and then boiling and then freezing again and so on. Um, so that, that is a, an issue. With regard to the laws of biology being perhaps different elsewhere, I can only say you may well be right. Uh, we have a long history, we humans do, of uh, thinking that our little niche in the universe uh, is the way the whole rest of the universe is. Uh, you know, the folks in Kansas for a long time thought everybody was white and Christian, but it turns out that elsewhere not everybody's white and Christian. So we may be similarly arrogant uh, right now in thinking that biology elsewhere is even remotely like biology is here on the earth. And so we have to be very conscious of our own arrogance and self-centeredness, anthropocentrism, you might say, uh, biocentrism, that maybe life elsewhere is more like the Horta in Star Trek based on silicon and so on. So that's, that's a, uh, that should give us a little pause for thought and a little humility. Last question. Yeah, the, you were looking, looks like you're looking primarily at visible light. Would it be that wavelengths way above or below might give you more? Why are you looking at visible light and what is it about other wavelengths? Yeah, that's a good question. The first answer is stars like our sun emit most of their light at visible wavelengths, blue, green, yellow, and red. But there are other stars, the cooler stars, indeed the small stars in the galaxy, the M dwarfs, emit most of their light in the infrared. And there are several groups in the world uh, very rapidly designing and building spectrometers for the backs of their telescopes that will take spectra of stars in the infrared for exactly the reason you said, so that then they can measure the Doppler shifts of these cooler stars that emit most of their light in the infrared. And we have a hard time observing those little stars in the visible light that we use because those little stars emit so little of that visible light. So if you want to know who is on these other planets, come back April 23rd for Jill Tarter. Please, everyone, drive carefully. We'll see you next time.